Last week, you're like, wait, I have to say people. Oh, let <laughs> me ask you right now. Just look back. Do we have no idea? No. Oh, 
Material book, uh, reference down. material book. So, like, you know, a list of, I would say, aluminum, uh, 70 centimeters. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. You, usually, I just look that up on the internet. <laughs> and so, if I, if there's a certain material that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in using, I just look it up, okay. just search it up. And then, um, usually, they'll list quite a few, like, especially for like a common metal, like aluminum. Then they'll have quite a few on them on there. And I just, I just see what yeah, it I was just supposed to was like a for problem, I think five or six. I think it was like five or six, but it's just like, you know, change, you know, don't change the wall dimensions, but you can use like the thickness, the material. Yeah. And so I was just wondering yeah, so if you have like a, I think my dad gave me like a, uh, like a material book, mm -hmm. you know, like a, um, like that has like how much it costs and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just wondering if there was like a website that you go to for like if you want to know what the young markers for materials are. Yeah, usually I just use Google. I, I know I know those books are out there and, and they can be useful. Um, it's just I, I I just personally don't use a lot of it in my work just because it's um, I do a lot of computational work anyway, and so a lot of times the material is kind of already selected for me and I just have to look up the properties for it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, it's uh, five thirty, so let's uh, go ahead and get started. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone, or, or good evening. Um, how's everyone? How's everyone feeling today? Good, good. I'm playing. Playing good. Okay. Um, so today, uh, I I did want to talk about the project, and so I know I know uh, quite a few of y'all have uh, have been looking at it already, and I've already, so I've already fielded some questions on it, and so you know just just so that we're all kind of on the same page, and you know we talk about all the requirements, I, I do want to spend you know a good chunk of today talking about it. Uh, so probably the first, you know, 25-ish, 30-ish minutes, then we're going to talk about the project, okay? Uh, and then after that, we're going to continue with our lecture notes. And so today, today's going to be a little bit of a hodgepodge in terms of lecture notes, because we uh, we do have a little bit left over from our lecture notes on material properties. And so I want to make sure I finish that. And then we're going to be starting to talk more about meshing stuff. Okay? And so I, I've been promising you guys all, all throughout this semester that we're going to talk a lot about meshing. And so today is gonna we're, we're gonna start on that journey, okay? So I think for the next two and a half weeks we're gonna be talking just uh, meshing stuff, and so because uh, it's important, it's it's a big part of finite elements, and I think compared to you know compared to other similar subjects like maybe what you've learned before in like a structural mechanics class or strength of materials, meshing I think is the most new thing, and it's all, it's also the most um, um, different than everything. And so I want to make sure we spend a good amount of time on that. Just so that you you all are aware of uh, you know what are the options available to you in Ansys and what are some common um, situations that you can run into with the meshing and how to get over those um, those issues. Okay. All right. Um, and so, are there any any questions I can answer before we uh, we get started? Yep. Uh, it it should be it should be the exact same. Um, I mean, the, the, the capability should be exactly the same. And so the, um, the license should be the, the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Version-wise, I'm not sure where they are on, on, updating, um, on updating these, but, um, but for all practical purposes, they should be exactly the same between the two. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, um, so there's no more questions. Let's go ahead and get started with the, uh, or just talking about the project, okay? And so, um, you know, kind of like, as I mentioned last week, you know, we, we do have a midterm exam in this class, but that's going to happen a lot later, okay? Because um, so far, you know, all we've really covered in the class is, is, you know, mostly how to use ANSYS. And then, you know, a lot of, I would say, kind of the practical implications for, you know, using ANSYS as a software, okay? And so instead of instead of making a midterm exam, I thought would it would have been a lot more appropriate to give you guys a, a project, okay? And that's what, uh, and that's what this is, okay? 
And so the idea with this uh, with this project is to um, basically give you give you all a chance to take a finite element analysis and take it from start to finish, right? And so, um, you know, this is very this this kind of workflow that I that I've designed for you in this project is very um, similar to what you would experience in industry. Okay? And so, you know, what what's going to happen is I'm going to give you all a, a CAD model. Okay, um, you can choose one, and so there there's several here that you can choose from, and then you're going to do all the meshing, all the boundary condition, material properties. Uh, you're going to run the simulations, and then you're going to write the report afterwards. Okay. Um, and so kind of, you know, start to finish, this is a, uh, I would, I would say kind of a, what you would kind of expect from a finite element simulation in general. Okay. And, and you all are, are, are equipped for it already, because, you know, we've gone through three ANSYS activities, you know, we've gone through, you know, five weeks of lecture. And so, um, you know, we, we, we've covered all of the basics of what you need to know to, you know, to do a complete finite element simulation. So I thought this was kind of a good timing for, for all of that as well. Okay. All right. Um, and so uh, here are your choices for the CAD models, okay? And so you only have to choose one, okay? So I highlighted, I uh, underlined it, and I bolded it, bolded it, okay? And so you have three options, but, you know, only choose one of them. And you don't, you don't get any extra credit for doing more than one. And so, you know, there's, uh, you know, and of course, you're, you're free to, you know, if you want to do more, then that's, that's, that's fine with me, but I can only give you credit for just one of them, okay? All right, and so for the first one, we have a bearing housing. And so you can imagine that there is a bearing shaft that kind of goes through the middle of here. And then these are fixed to the, uh, um, to wherever it's, it's fixed to. Okay. Uh, second option is a turbine blade. Okay. And so this would be a, a blade that you might see inside a wind turbine or like a, uh, or like an, like an aircraft engine. Okay. And third is a wall bracket. Okay. And so this is kind of a pretty um, standard issue bracket that you would use to fasten something to a wall or, or hang something from a wall. Okay. All right, and I and I can't take credit for for creating these CAD models. So these are created by Ansys Learning Hub. Okay, um, and I just kind of took those um, took those CADs and kind of repurposed them for this uh, for this project. Okay, and so um, you know if you go to the course website, you'll see that I have links for all three of these files here. Okay, and so just like we've been doing for the activities, you're just going to download the the CAD files and then load them up, load them up into Ansys. Um, you know exactly as, as as you have been doing. Okay, the big difference here is that you know for all the activities, um, you know I've I've given you a lot of instruction more or less on how to do the meshing and the boundary conditions and the material properties. Uh, but for this project, you know a lot of that is going to be up to you. You know based on um, based on what you think is best for the situation and what is kind of physically most realistic on this. All right. So any uh, any questions so far before we talk about the uh, the requirements? Okay. All right. So let's talk about the requirements. And so your, your project is going to have uh, multiple different, um, um, multiple different components. Okay. Um, and all of these are going to be summarized into a report, right? But, but the first part of the requirements is what I like to call a project objective. Okay. Um, and so what I mean by this is that, you know, when, it, when you run a finite element simulation, there's always some piece of information or something that you want to find out from the simulation, um, you know, and that's and that's that's going to be your objective, okay? And so, you know, very rarely do you ever see that finite element simulations are performed just just for the sake of, of performing finite elements, right? Um, I think a lot of people like to look at the the pictures and the and the uh, uh, and the images that result from finite elements, but those by themselves are not really that useful, okay? And so, a lot of times, you know, finite elements they're uh, um, you know they're run by engineers to want to see. Um, they want to answer questions like, you know, is this part going to fail or what's the maximum stress in this part? How much deflection, how much deformation am I going to get? Okay. And so you can think of this objective like very similarly to how you would think of like a hypothesis that you would, um, that you would normally use for like a, like a laboratory experiment, right? And so, um, you know, I'm sure you all are experienced that, you know, whenever you run a laboratory experiment, um, you know, you're not just, uh, you know, running an experiment just, just for fun, right? You're, there's a hypothesis that you're trying to prove or disprove, okay? And so this objective is, is serves a very, very similar role to that, right? And so before you launch into the finite element simulation, you need to think about, you know, what, um, what is the quantity of interest here? What, what would be of most interest for this kind of geometry? And how can I use the finite element simulation to, um, you know, to find out that information, okay? Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm not telling you what the objective is here for, for your project, just because, you know, it's, it's something that I want you to think about yourself, okay? And it's going to be dependent on what um, what geometry that you pick too, right? 
because uh, if you if you think about it, you know, and you think about um, and you do a little research on, you know, what are bearing houses used for in practice? What are turbine blades used for in practice? What are wall brackets used for in practice? Right? Uh, what kind of what kind of loads do they experience? What kind of um, what kind of um, you know constraints do they experience? Uh, what are their what are their main concerns um, in their use? Okay. And so I want you to do a little bit of research into these parts. And so you know these these parts are not that complicated. But I think they um, they have a lot of really interesting use scenarios, right? And so based on you know what you find for you know what what are um, you know what are these um, typical use cases are, then from that you can formulate your objective, and then from your objective that's going to drive you know how you how you do your finite element simulations, okay? And so the objective is really important. And so you know I I, I do want you guys to spend a decent amount of time thinking about this. Um, and you know, coming up with a good one for your finite element uh, project. Okay, all right. And so the next uh, important part for the um, for the project is the methodology. Okay, and so this is the part where you're going to talk about all of the finite element modeling decisions that you're that you're making, right? And so you know, what choices, what materials are going to choose for the uh, for the simulation? What meshing simu what meshing settings are you going to use? What meshing size, element order, um, element shape, right? Uh, what kind of boundary conditions are you going to apply? You know, what are the loads that you're um, that you're putting on? What are the constraints, right? And then why are you choosing these these loads? Um, and so, you know, I want you to read really detailed about all the decisions that you're making, all the choices that you make, um, and I want you to justify it. Okay. And so the key word here is is really justify because you know what you'll find out very quickly that um, you know, and, and this is true for you know even the most seasoned um, finite element engineers, but. I would say it's especially true for uh, for young engineers, you know, just getting into the field, is that the main struggle that you're going to face, um, you know, doing any kind of computational work, is not actually running the simulation. Your your main struggle is going to be convincing other people that what you did is actually legit. Um, because I'll I'll give you the impression that that a lot of you know, especially older engineers that they have, for like a young engineer coming in and doing finite elements, that you know, what a lot of people think is that you know these are just you know kids. Just punching numbers on on the computer and making pretty animations, right? And so you know, it's really you're going to struggle a lot to to prove to people that you know what you're doing is actually you know it's actually useful and it's actually you know you're getting you're getting real results for this that can be really really helpful. Okay, and so part of part of that part of you know part of you know convincing people that what you're doing is good is to make sure that you're you're selecting all these things you know um, intelligently, right? Like you're you're meshing intelligently, your boundary conditions make sense. Your material properties make sense, right? And so, you know, really think about all the decisions. You know, when you're writing your report and you're doing your simulation, you know, I want you to think about, you know, what what is every single decision that I'm making in terms of this finite element simulation. Make sure I write it down. Make sure you write it down, and then, you know, make sure you have a reason why you're choosing those those things. Okay. And so, you know, a big portion of your grade is going to be based on this section right here because, you know, it's 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 been mostly what we've been talking about so far in this class, right? Um, and so, you know, um, how to choose your mesh, how to choose your material properties, right? And so, you know, a lot of my, what, what, I'm, what I'm gonna grade you on is you, first of all, how detailed you are in, 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 in talking about these things, but also, you know, how well do you justify it? You know, what are the reasons why you're, you're choosing all those, those things, okay? All right, uh, and then specifically with regards to the boundary conditions, I, I want you to think of uh, several different loading scenarios, okay? And so I want you to come up with three, okay? Um, and so that could be different boundary conditions. It could be different material properties. Okay? So very similar to the uh, um, to activity three that you all are working on right now. Okay. And so um, you know I want you to come up with three different ways, three different configurations for your finite elements um, as part of this project. Okay. All right. Question. So uh, will we be allowed to get feedback from you, like how the report looks or how it's made, uh, or is it more like a take home exam? Yeah, you can get feedback from me. Um, and so actually, you know, I, I would encourage it too, because there's, you know, I'm giving you, I'm giving you all a lot of freedom with this, uh, with this project. And I've, I've already had people talk to me about, you know, um, do these specific loads make sense? Or does these constraints make sense? Um, or, you know, or just even talking about, you know, what are these parts used for in practice? You know, what are their, what are their particular load scenarios? And so I'm, I'm happy to discuss those with, with you all. So, you know, please, yes, please, please talk to me and get feedback. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, um, I think it'll be, you know, It'll be a good thing, right? Um, hey, professor, the, oh, question. Yeah, the gravitational force. Should we use that on every object we do, or only really big objects? Yeah, no, it's a good question. So, yeah, gravitational force. I, you know, it, it's always going to be present. You know, unless you're doing something in, in space, obviously. 
Um, but whether how significant it is, I think depends on how big the object is. Um, and so for the last activity, we included it because the sign was just, you know, really massive. And the weight of those parts are, is actually going to make a big difference on, you know, what you're, what you're going to get from your finite element results. But for a much smaller part, uh, you can, of course, include it, but probably what you'll find is that it's not going to make um, as big an impact. Um, yeah. But yeah, I would say, you know, and, and it's pretty easy. The only thing you have to make sure is that for your material, you, you just have a density there that you can, um, that, it, that it can use to compute the weight. All right. Um, and so the next section of the final report is going to be your actual simulation results. Okay. And so this is formatted very similarly to your activities. And so, you know, I'm, I'm going to be expecting a lot of screenshots of, you know, deformation fields, stress fields. Um, you know, I think at the very least, I expect total deformation and equivalent stress. Okay. Um, but, you know, one, one thing that, uh, and, um, you know, and, I, and I've been a little bit lax with this on the activities, but, um, you know, just because the activities I, I mostly just grade on completion, but, you know, in addition to posting your screenshots, you know, I want, I also want a little bit of explanation in the text about, you know, what, what I should be seeing from your results. Okay. And so what I, what I've seen in, in, in projects in the past from, um, from this class is that people just, they kind of just, they run their simulation and just plop like 20 screenshots in a row from ANSYS. And then I'm kind of scrolling through all of them and I'm not really sure what I should be looking at. It's just a bunch of plots just to kind of pad the length of the report. And so, you know, I want to make sure that you all are looking at the, uh, you're looking at the results and you're interpreting them and you, uh, and you kind of tell the reader what they should be looking for too. Okay. And so I am going to, you know, I am, um, you know, going to expect some explanation in the, in the text of what these figures are showing. Okay. Um, it could be just be as simple as, you know, this is the total deformation field. The maximum deformation is this, and it occurs there, right? That's really all it has to be because, um, you know, even just something as simple as that is, is you know, much better than just, you know, a cascade of, of 20 different screenshots, right? Um, and so, um, you know, make sure you're explaining your results a bit well too, okay? And a lot, a lot of this, you know, and a lot of this information is explained in the rubric too, which we'll go over in, in a little bit um, as well. Um, and so, you know, you can refer to the rubric. Okay. Um, and then there's the conclusion. And so, you know, conclusion, just, you know, just kind of wrap up your report because this is going to be a fairly, you know, fairly long report. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, just kind of, just kind of wrap things up. Okay. All right. Um, so the report, oh, uh, any questions on any of this so far? Um, yeah. Are we able to use, I'm not sure what the fault but are we able to use those, um, um, markers on the results. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think that would uh, that would certainly be helpful. Um, but that's that's not a replacement for the text. So make sure you're still kind of explaining stuff. But I, I would love to see those uh, those markers as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, report template. Okay. And so um, so I gave I've also posted a template that you can use. Okay. Um, so please use the template. Right. Um, so the main thing that helps that helps me with the template is that it's it separates it separates your report into all the sections that I'm expecting, right? Um, and so this is really oh question. So we use slate tag. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And so you know, um, if you don't, um, the main thing I'm looking for in the report is just making sure that the uh, that all the sections are there. And so um, if you want to use LaTeX or if you want to use you know a different font or different spacing, I'm I'm okay with that. Um, the only thing I ask is that make sure the, the sections are very clearly labeled and then, you know, everything um, is included in the section that, you know, that should be there. Okay. Um, and so, you know, I, I use Times New Roman for this, uh, for this template, just because that's kind of what I grew up with. But, you know, I know some people don't like Times New Roman. And so if you want to change the font or you want to use LaTeX or, or something, you know, feel free. The only thing I, I ask is that, you know, just please include all these, all these different sections. Okay. And, you know, in this template, I've, I've kind of explained what I expect in each section, you know, kind of a little bit of a repeat of, of the uh, project instructions, but, you know, just to kind of help you out with, with that. Okay. All right, question. So, uh, is this, so this is individual reporting, right? No teams. Yes. So this is an individual, this is an individual project. And actually there's a section for that in the, uh, in the, temp, in the uh, instructions. And so, um, you know, I have a section here on teams, and so there are no teams. And so, you know, everyone needs to run their own simulation. Everyone needs to write their own report and submit it. Okay. Uh, but with that said, you know, I, I, I do encourage you all to, to work together. Okay. Um, because this is, I think, probably the biggest Antis undertaking that we've, that, um, you know, I've asked you, I've asked you to do. And, you know, undoubtedly, you know, um, a lot of you will, will run into issues with the software, right? So you'll get errors with the meshing or with the boundary conditions. Okay. 
And so I definitely encourage you all to, to work together and, and, and collaborate. Okay? Um, of course, use me as a resource too if you, uh, if you, if you really run into issues. But, you know, um, but what I am expecting is that everyone to write their own report and to generate their own, to generate their own plots. But, but other than that, you know, you can feel free to work together. And, and in fact, I think it'll make for a much, much better experience um, overall. All right, and so final remarks. And so this is, you know, I, I think it's going to be a fairly big undertaking. And so, you know, this is also a little bit of an experiment on, on my end because I've, I've I've never given a midterm project before, um, and so I've I've, all, I've only ever given a final project. And so with this midterm project, I, I kind of you know tailored back a little bit, and so I cut out some requirements um, that I would normally ask for because um, if because if you uh, because kind of looking ahead a little bit, your final project will actually be very similar to this. They'll just have a little bit more requirements. Um, and so I, I basically took the template from what I did for the final project in past years, and I took out you know quite a few sections, you know, just based on what we've covered in the class and, and what I thought was reasonable. But at the same time, you know, I, I know that this is going to be uh, an experiment as well. And so you know, please you know please keep me updated with how you all are doing, um, you know, and, and if things you know start to get really crazy, then I'm 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 always open to adjust the assignment based on based on how how it's going. Okay, um, because you know, um, I because you know just just in general, you know, I, I I always try my best to design you know the activities for for you all to be reasonable, but also you know challenging so that you guys will will get something out of it. But you know, more than half or most of the time, you know, a, a lot of what I come up with doesn't always work out the way that I want, and so. You know, for the for you know something big like this, you know, I really rely a lot on the feedback that you guys give me to really kind of adjust this and just to make sure that it's it's a good experience for everyone. Okay, and so if you know if it's not working out for you or you're struggling a lot, then you know please you know please don't feel hesitant to, to come to me. And so um, you know I'm I'm not married to this project, and so you know I won't take it personally if you think that it's it's unreasonable or anything like that. So you know, um, definitely keep me updated and, uh, you know, and we'll, we'll kind of take it step by step. Okay. Um, deadline. And so the deadline for this project is a little bit over a month from now, um, actually one month and one day. Okay. And so it'll be due right before um, Halloween. Okay. And so I, I really wanted to, you know, a big goal of mine was to get this to you guys as soon as possible so that you have as much time as you need to, to work on. It, okay. Um, uh, so, yeah. Um, I think that's that's everything for the project. Um, any do, uh, are there any questions about the project? You know, before we uh, we move on to the next thing. Do you mind uh, just going further in depth with the, um, by keywords and that template? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So so this template right here is a uh, one that's used for actually scientific papers. Okay, and so the keywords are um, basically just uh, if you think about it, if if someone, if you want someone to look up your report through a uh, through a Google search, and then these are the keywords that you would use. And so, um, and so, I, I honestly, it, it was kind of just a remnant of this report template. Uh, but if you uh, if you want, um, you know, you can list words like finite elements. I think would be a good one, um, or maybe like what your what what your problem geometry that you chose. So like shaft bearing or or turbine um, fan or something like that. Um, and you can even put class or, or things like that too. But I, I'm not going to be looking at that too closely, but you know, if you could, if you could sum up your, if you could sum up your report in like, you know, I know here it says up to eight, but uh, but eight eight is kind of a lot for something like this. And so if you can come up with, you know, maybe three or four like 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 hashtags, I guess for for your report, um, then that's that's what you would put there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and you know, another thing for this report too is that you know I I want to. You know, I want to give you you all like um, material for your portfolio, right? And so what I mean by that is, you know, I, I think what a lot of people end up doing is that, you know, after you take this class, you list on your resume that you can do finite elements, that you can use ANSYS. And so I think that's one thing. I think it's another thing to um, have a report like this, like this and the final project to bring to a job interview to really show that, you know, I can do finite elements and this is the report that I put together from this class. I think that's a lot more meaningful than you know someone just listing on their resume that they can use ANSYS. And so I've I've had multiple students come and talk to me, you know, after you know over the summers and and things like that that said, you know, I brought my final um, project report to a job interview and they're really impressed and then they offered me a job based on that, right? And so this is an opportunity for you to you know base based on everything that we've learned so far to kind of have the receipts or to kind of have the uh, the proof that you know you can do finite elements and here's and here's you know a very you know 
lengthy and sophisticated report that, that shows that. Okay. And so with this and the final project, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that it's uh, something, something that you can take away from this class beyond just, just one line in, in your resume. Because a lot, a lot of times people put that uh, um, people I, I I and I personally know people that do this is that they they've used the software once and so you know they might use Ansys just because uh, um, you know they took like a one hour training on it and then they put on the resume that they can use Ansys right and obviously they you know that's not the same as as you all kind of taking this class and and really learning it in depth and so you know this report and and other things that you can put in your portfolio is what's going to separate you from those those people that you know. They use it once and say, hey, I'm an expert in ANSYS versus, you know, you all where you guys are really going to be experts in ANSYS. And this is what's going to show it. OK. OK. All right, question. So uh, is the midterm exam during the lecture conceptual based instead of completing an ANSYS? Yes. Yeah. And so uh, what we're going to do, I think, starting in a couple of weeks is that we're going to be diving uh, a bit more into the theory behind ANSYS. And so um, mostly you know, I mostly want to illustrate to you guys how um, how ANSYS kind of puts together their systems of equations. And so it's a little bit of a, you know, look under the hood of, of how, you know, finite elements actually works. And so that um, and so that midterm exam will be conceptual based. And there's also going to be some some hand calculations that as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. All right. And so that's the midterm project. And so, um, you know, please start early and, and keep me updated how things are going. Let me go ahead and join here. All right. And so for the uh, um, for the agenda for today, um, you know we have uh, you know quite a bit to go. And so um, you know I want to talk about uh, I want to finish up our lecture notes on material properties. Um, and then I want to start talking in more into um, element, more element mesh stuff. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes. You were uh, born and raised in ANSYS. That was uh, that's the point I want to get across for you guys. Okay. Uh, and so I know it's a lot of learning objectives, but you know um, I do want to get into it. And so um, you can you can find these learning objectives later on. Okay. All right. And so let's go ahead and finish up our lecture notes on material properties. And so there was one more there was one more kind of subject that I wanted to go over, which is the subject of um, hyperelasticity. Okay. All right. And so you know, um, if you kind of remember from from a week ago, we were talking about um, you know different material properties or material models which describe how different materials respond to stresses right, or external loads. And so, so far we've, we've just covered algebraic models. And so what that means is that, um, you know, the, the stress and strain are related through an algebraic um, equation. Okay. And so the simplest of this is, of course, um, you know, isotropic um, linear elasticity. Right? And so in isotropic linear elasticity, we have this equation where stress is equal to the Young's modulus times the strain, right? And so this equation is algebraic because all it involves is just a uh, you know a simple multiplication of, of two different of two different things. Okay. Uh, but even you know even the orthotropic material model and even the uh, um, even the um, was the other one? Anisotropic material model. Those were are actually also algebraic because all those were were just a multiplications of different material constants um, multiplied by the string. Okay, and so all of these kind of fall under that same category. Okay? And so I think you know algebraic algebraic material models are, are nice just because they uh, um, you know they're relatively simple to understand um, and they're relatively simple to compute. Okay, but the weakness of um, algebraic material models, uh, specifically you know linear elasticity. Is that they only are really valid for small deformations. Okay. 
even if you include, um, you know, plastic, the plastic deformation, right, plasticity, um, there's a limitation to how much you can, you can, you can use for that as well. Um, um, you know, especially for some certain kind of stranger materials. Okay? And so what hyperelasticity does is that it, it kind of takes this stress strain relationship and kind of redefines it in a very different way. Okay. Uh, do you guys go over hyperelasticity at all in, in any of your previous classes? Okay, yeah, I, so I, I, it, was, it was a new thing for me too when I got to grad school, because I, I didn't learn it at all in, in undergrad, right? And so what hyperelasticity says is that, you know, instead of having an algebraic stress-strain relationship, What hyperelasticity says is that you know let's um, let's kind of redefine it in a different way, and so let's let's define a um, a function called a strain energy function. Okay. Right, and so it's it's kind of a whole new different formulation for how you know, internal stresses and strains are related in the material, right? And so you know this this whole topic of hyperelasticity, I think you know I think if we really wanted to really understand it, would take you know quite a few weeks to really um, dive into it. Uh, but I can give you kind of a spark notes version of how you can um, how you can understand this, right? And so the strain energy function, basically, what it assumes is that it assumes the material has a certain amount of potential energy, okay? Um, and then this, and that this potential energy is conserved as the um, as your object goes through different deformations or states of deformation. Okay. And so really what it is, it, it's kind of a, a, way, um, it, a way to express the stress-strain relationship through like a conservation of energy kind of lens or conservation of energy kind of perspective. Okay. And so what this allows for is that this allows for um, very nonlinear um, stress-strain relationships, okay? Um, that would otherwise not be possible with, with the simple algebraic model, okay? And so generally a hyperelastic material model um, um, do, does not assume any plastic deformation takes place, okay? Okay, um, and generally they require you know more 
more data to specify compared to the algebraic marks. And so, um, you know, if you, um, you can find hyper, a lot of hyperelastic models within ANSYS. And so um, actually, if you, uh, if you define a new material property and then you go, instead of doing isotropic elasticity, you do hyperelasticity instead, okay? You'll see that there are a lot of parameters that are, that are available. All right, any questions on, uh, on this so far? And so with the hyperelastic material model, you know, you might be able to get a stress strain curve that looks uh, something like this. Okay. And so you might get, you know, something very nonlinear, um, just like that. Okay. All right. And so if you want to use a hyperelastic model, um, there are two, there are two kind of levels of decisions that you have to make. Okay. And so first, uh, the first decision you have to make is the, is the form of the strain energy function. Okay, and there are a lot out there. And so, if you, uh, if um, you know, and and you know, those of you in the class can can check this right now too. That you know, if you open up Antis Workbench and you look at the list of hyperelastic models out there, you'll see that there's a huge, huge list there, and so way more than um, than one person would ever would ever want or need, right? And the unfortunate thing about these different strain energy models. Um, and, and, you know, um, if you know me at all, then, you know, this is my biggest, biggest pet peeve is that they're named after the scientists that, that, uh, that discovered them. Right? And so some, some, um, some hyperelastic models that I've, that I've personally worked with are, I call it St. Benon Kirchhoff, right? Okay. Uh, another one that's popular is Neil Hookian. And one that's particularly popular for biological materials like uh, like uh, like muscle tissue and things like that is called a Mooney Rivlin. And so, of course, you know because these are named after the scientists that discovered them, they don't tell you at all what they're used for. So they're just random names put together, right? And so I personally, I personally hate that, but you know, that's just how they're, they're named. Okay. Um, and so, you know, if you want to use a hyperelastic uh, material model, then, um, you know, you have to consider the whatever material that you're using. And then, you know, you're, you're probably going to have to do some digging in the literature. So look on Google Scholar of, you know, what are some hyperelastic models that work well with, you know, this certain kind of plastic that I'm using, or maybe works well with this, you know, biological material, right? And so there's a lot of kind of individual research that you have to do. Okay? And so after you've chosen the form of your strain energy function, there's actually more um, that you have to specify because each of these strain energy functions have um, different parameters that you have to specify. Okay? Because different strain energy functions can work well with, uh, you know, with, um, you know, with with different kinds of materials, and what's best and what differentiates them are the parameters that you actually choose. Okay, and so you can think of these parameters as things like, you know, the Young's modulus um, and the Poisson's ratio. Okay, um, but you know, their their exact interpretation depends on the strain energy function that you choose. Okay, um, and so you know, unfortunately, you know, that's that's all the time that we have to talk about um, hyperelasticity. 
you know, of course, this goes a lot deeper than this, but I just want to make you aware that, you know, it is there. And so if you, um, you know, if you go out into the into the real world and they ask you to use hyperelasticity, then you'll at least know somewhat what they're talking about and you'll know that ants can can do it. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions on uh, any, any of this? Okay. All right. And so that's a uh, hyperelasticity oh, question. What kind? What kind of uh, materials are hyperelastic? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good question. And so, um, you know, what I what I've personally used them for a lot are, are biological materials, right? Um, and so, um, I've done a lot of research myself on on um, you know on like blood vessel walls or like muscle tissue or like soft tissue, right? And so, those types of materials, because you know they're kind of a composite of a lot of different um, kind of biological materials, um, collagen being a big part of that, then those at least at least at least state of the art right now. Uh, right now, you know, hyperelasticity is, is most often used to model those, but um, they're also used a lot for, uh, for composite materials. And so basically any kind of material where you're going to have a non-linear stress strain relationship, either because you're mixing materials or you're, or you're depositing some kind of particles or particulates into your material, um, I would say those, those are popular choices for, or hyperelasticity is a popular choice to model those, uh, those materials. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, and so that's uh, everything with material properties. And so um, let's um, go ahead and move on to the next topic. Okay, and so over the next um, you know three lectures, so today, Thursday, and next Tuesday, you know prior to the, our next activity, um, we're going to talk be talking a lot about elements, right? And so the different element, um, the different options that you have when selecting your elements. Okay, and in particular, I, I want to start today by talking about element order. And so we talked about this briefly when we went over our meshing basics, but I, I want to kind of come back to it because it, it is it is actually a really important choice, you know, that you're making uh, when you're specifying your, your finite element in mesh. Okay. All right, and so just to kind of uh, refresh your memory, the element order refers to the um, polynomial order or the order of the polynomial of the approximating finite element function. Okay. And so generally what we have uh, available to us is uh, in, in most, you know, finite element softwares are either a linear function or a quadratic one. Okay. And so for a generic linear function, we, we have uh, two terms available. And so we have the constant term A0 and we have the linear term A1x. And so for quadratic function, we have three, we have three terms available, right? Because so we have u of x is equal to a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared. Right. And so these are the most generic you know, polynomials of these type that you can have, right? And and what differentiates you know, different linear functions from other ones are going to be the values of these uh, coefficients right here. Okay. And so you can think of these coefficients as kind of our degrees of freedom. And so this is this is what we're free to choose, you know, based on um, you know other conditions that we, we can apply. Okay. And in fact, you know, the way that finite elements works is that, you know, if you kind of remember from our discussions from before that, you know, the way finite elements works is that, um, you know, ANSYS or whatever finite element software, 
they've already decided, you know, beforehand, before you even try to solve anything, that, you know, the solution is either going to be a linear function or a quadratic one, depending on what you choose, okay? And so the way that ANSYS chooses these coefficients is that it chooses them in a way that makes it so that these functions match the true solution as closely as possible. Because remember, you know, the way that finite element solves problems is, is or solves uh, differential equations is, is very different than I think, you know, what's what's taught in a lot of classes is that, you know, in a lot of classes, you take your equation and then you solve it directly. And then whatever you get from the solution, that's just your solution. Right? So the way finite elements works is that, you know, it's going to decide right away that, you know, we're going to look for the best, you know, instead of finding what the function is, that we're going to decide right before that, you know, we're going to use a quadratic function. And we're going to find the best quadratic function that fits this solution. Okay. And so an analogy that I want to draw for you, for you all is, uh, um, you know, how best fit lines work, right? And so if you've ever used a spreadsheet program, you'll know that there's a, um, there's a feature in, in the spreadsheets, whether this be Google Sheets or whether it be Microsoft Excel, um, or if you use LibreOffice, right? That you can take a set of data points and you can find the line that best fits through those, those data points, right? And so let's say that you know you're using a, a spreadsheet software and then you have a bunch of data points and so you've made a scatter plot okay. and so all these dots here are our points of data okay okay and so you know you have the data here it, it looks kind of it looks kind of messy right and so what you can do is that you can ask microsoft excel to say that, um, okay, you know, here's all my data, but you know, I'd like to fit a trend line to this, or I'd like to fit a function that best matches this data as closely as possible, right? And so let's say that you chose a linear function. Right? And so let's say that you, um, the Microsoft Excel draws a line through your, um, draws a line through your data, okay? And this is the one that kind of tries to fit it the best. And so if you've ever been curious about, you know, how this works or how Excel does this, it does this through a, um, an algorithm called least squares. Okay. That's really scuffed, but it says, it says least squares. Okay. Basically, the way least squares works is that they, uh, um, you know, it takes it takes every single data point and then it measures the distance between that data point and the trend line, right? And so it does this for every single data point that you have. Okay? And so what least squares does is it uh, it basically optimizes the the shape and it optimizes the trajectory of this curve such that the square distance between the data points and the line is minimized throughout all the data points, right? And so that's why when you ask um, Microsoft Excel to, to produce a trend line, most of the time it produces one that, that looks like it's kind of passing through the data as, as closely as possible, okay? And so finite elements works in a, in a very similar way. It's, it's, not, it's not really, okay, it's not really the same, but you know, the, the idea is, is the same. And so with finite elements, you know, instead of having a bunch of data points here, what you have instead is a solution to a differential equation that you're trying to match as closely as possible, right? But what finite elements is doing is, is deciding beforehand that, you know, we're going to look for the best linear function, the best quadratic that, you know, passes through this solution as closely as possible. Okay. And so it doesn't use least squares for that. It, it uses actual finite element theory. Um, but the, I think the analogy is, is very much the same. Okay. And so when you're choosing an order for your elements, that's either, you know, linear or quadratic, this is essentially the choice that you're, um, that you're making, what kind of function you can put it. 
Because um, in Excel too, you know, like you can you can decide what, what kind of function that you want to fit through your data. And so you can either use a linear function, you can use a quadratic function, you can use a exponential function, right? Um, and so really, you know, the world is your oyster. And so you can kind of choose whatever function that you think fits the, uh, fits the best. Okay. All right, uh, any questions on, on any of this so far? <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, just going back to this analogy, uh... So then the black dots would represent kind of our, our boundary conditions and um, in a way our material properties. And then we, us choosing the uh, linear quadratic would be our best fit uh, one. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great way to think about it. And so the black data points, like, would, it would represent things like your, uh, like your boundary conditions, right? And so your finite element solution has to respect the boundary conditions as closely as possible. And so it basically tries to find the best, you know, type of function that you have that matches all the specifications and the parameters that, that you have. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Um, and so how, and so now the question is, you know, how does finite elements actually choose these parameters? And so I, I do want to go over that briefly, okay? Because it leads into this uh, kind of very important concept of finite elements called the, the shape functions, okay? Okay, and so the way these uh, these um, coefficients are chosen, they're chosen such that they um, such that the solutions at the nodes in your finite element mesh they match all together. Okay. Okay, and this is really important because uh, um, you know you want to make sure that you know um, at the nodes of your mesh, you know every element gets the same answer for all those nodes. Okay, because those nodes are kind of the connections in between different elements, right? And so let me just draw kind of a one D case for you. Okay, and so let's say that you know we have a one dimensional finite element mesh. Okay. Right, and we have two elements here, and so this is going to be element A. Okay. And this is element B, okay. right? And so you can see here that they share this, this node right in between, okay? And so that node kind of marks the transition or marks the, um, um, the traversal between one element to another, okay? And so what should happen is that, um, you know, what element A determines for the solution at this node, okay? Should match what element B gets at that same node, right? Because it doesn't really do us any good if, if you solve for the solution element A, you know, and the solution does something like this, right? But then you solve for the solution element B, and then element B gets something, you know, completely different, right? And so that's not helping anybody. And that's, that's actually, you know, really, really bad. And so the way that, you know, um, the way that we ensure that we have this consistency is just to make, is to form the, um, the polynomials or to solve for these constants such that the, uh, these nodal values are, are consistent, okay? And so I'll do just a, a very quick example for you. Okay, maybe it's not too quick, but you know, the simplest example that you can do for this for a linear 1D um, finite element. Okay, and so for a linear 1D finite element, we have something like this. Okay. I'll call the, uh, the node on the left, we'll call that node one, and then the node on the right, we'll call it node two. Okay. And the positions or the 1D positions of these nodes are gonna be X1 and X2. Okay. And, then, and then the nodal values on the, uh, um, and then the values of the solution at these nodes will be U1 and U2, okay? And so since this is a linear function, our, um, our finite element polynomial looks like this, okay? And so it's gonna be u of x is equal to 
a0 plus a1x, okay? Where, you know, the goal for this exercise is gonna to be to solve for these constants, okay? Such that, such that the uh, the solution that we get on this element is u one at the left and u two on the right. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up a system of algebraic equations um, in order to solve for A0 and, and A1, okay? Um, using those two conditions. All right, and so the first thing we're gonna require, first thing we're gonna require is that U, our function U of X, okay? When we specify this at X is equal to X1, This has to equal u1, okay? And so let's take our general form for our linear polynomial and plug in x is equal to x1. Okay? So this can be a0 plus a1, x1, okay? And then our second condition, which is u at x is equal to x2 is equal to u2, which is equal to a0 plus a1, x2. And so now what we have is a system of two equations um, that we can solve for the two unknowns, which is a0 and a1. Okay. All right. And so I'm just going to do this kind of quickly because it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, not really the point of this, uh, uh, or the algebra is not really the point of this, um, you know, this lecture. And so I'm just going to go quickly. Okay. And so the one way that you can solve for this is you can um, subtract both equations from each other. Okay. And so that's going to cancel out both the a0s. Okay, and you get u1 minus u2 is equal to a1 times x1 minus x2. Okay. Right, and then that's that's going to give us a way to solve for a1 from this, uh, from this equation. Okay. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right. And so we solve for a1, and a1 what we get is u1 minus u2 divided by x1 minus x2. All right, and so what we can do from here, so now that we've solved for a1, we can go ahead and plug this back into our equation. Okay, and then we can do that to solve for a0. And so you can do you can do either equation, either of them works. And so I'm just going to use the first one. Okay. And so we have um, u1 is equal to a0 plus a1, where a1 we just solve for it. Okay. Times x1. Okay. And we solve this equation for a0, and what we get is a0 is equal to u my, u1 minus u1 minus u2 divided by x1 minus x2 times x1. Okay. All right. And so now that we have a0 and a1, we can go ahead and plug everything in and we can get our, our function. Right? And so our overall function is going to be u of x is equal to a0, so A0 is U1 minus U1 minus U2 divided by X1 minus X2. Yeah, yeah, so plug in, uh, plug in back into A1 and A0 because we, we want to get the overall, the overall function out. Right, and so we plug in for both a zero and a one back in, and we end up with uh, we end up with this 
function here. Okay. My stylus is kind of scuffed today. Okay. And so if uh, you know if the basically you know if the finite element solution follows this function here, then we can keep consistent node values throughout the entire uh, throughout the entire solution, which is you know which is which is what we want because we want the uh, solution to be consistent across node values. Okay. All right. And so actually, you know, if you if you do something similar for all the other nodes in the mesh, you'll get you know these um, these finite element solutions on each element look very similar. Okay. All right. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm, I'm going to rearrange this a little bit. And so I'm going to use some algebraic magic um, to basically rearrange it so that we have one term multiplied by u1 and another term multiplied by u2. Are we missing an x1? Yes, we are. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right, and so if we rearrange this, and so if we rearrange this uh, uh, in a way, was there another question? Let me see. Oh, sorry. Okay. And so if we rearrange this, we can uh, get a function that looks like the following. Okay. We can get one term that has all the u1s, and so Basically, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm factoring out u1 out of certain terms, and then everything with u1 is going to be here, OK? And this is going to be x minus x2. Right? So obviously, you know, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of steps. And so um, you know, I apologize for that. But um, you know, I, I do want to make sure we get to the punch one for today. And so if we rearrange this uh, this function, then um, you know we get something that looks like like this. And so um, you know it's 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 a lot of algebra, uh, I know, but uh, um, you can just kind of trust me that we get to this result. Okay. All right. And so this form of the equations is really useful because you know what we have here is we've kind of separated them out into one term which has the solution at the first node u one. And another term which has the solution at the other node u2. Okay. And so these things that I've boxed right here, you know, these are just purely a function of x and they're only a function of the locations. Okay. And so these box quantities, these are known as shape functions. Okay. And what shape functions do is that they, they help us. You know, um, first of all, they help us kind of form the finite element solution on the element, and then they also, um, you know, help us, um, you know, interpolate nodal values, you know, later on. Okay. And so on the next page, you know, we're going to talk a bit more about the properties of shape functions, and you know, kind of why they're important for uh, for finite elements, okay? or how they're kind of linked with, you know, kind of all the other things that we've we've been talking about. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so any any questions on um, on this? Okay. All right. So let's talk about uh, shape functions. All right. And so the first thing you should notice about shape functions is that their polynomial order or the, the order of the shape functions is the exact same as the order of the elements. And so, you know, for this uh, for this past example, we started with a linear function, and we ended up with linear uh, with linear shape functions. Okay. All right. Another thing you should notice that there's um, you're always going to have one shape function per node. And so in the previous example, we have um, you know, two, two nodes in our element. And so we have two shape functions. Okay. 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 
And so the, uh, um, you know, and, and, you know, beyond, I'd say kind of the first two are kind of the most important points and then three, three and beyond is kind of more trivia, you know, for, for this class, right? And so uh, one other thing about shape functions is, is, is if you add them all together for a particular element, If you add them all together, you're going to get one. Okay. okay. Uh, and number four, um, you know, again, this is kind of trivia just because, you know, we're not really going in this direction for this class. But if you evaluate the shape function at the matching node, and so in other words, you know, for this, for this shape function here associated with U1, so oftentimes we'll call this S1, okay? If you evaluate the shape function at the, at the corresponding node, then you're going to get one. But if you evaluate the shape function at any other node, then you're going to get zero. Okay. All right. And so, you know, going forward and to kind of, you know, bring this back, because I, I know there's kind of a, you know, quite a bit of math today, okay? And so I, I want to kind of focus on, on property number two, okay? Because this, this, um, this, this kind of has practical implications for, you know, what you're doing for your, um, you know, for your ANSYS simulation, okay? Um, actually, you know, this kind of like first two, first two of these combined. And so for a linear, for a linear finite element, like we saw, um, you know, previously, we saw that we had um, two nodes, okay? And if you think back to, you know, our original form of our equation, right? The original form of our linear equation, we had two, we had two constants, right? Two constants that we need to solve for, okay? And so in order to solve for these two constants, we needed two equations, right? And then uh, with two equations, what that told us is that we needed two nodes, okay? okay. Let's, look at, let's look at our quadratic function. And so in our quadratic function, you can see we have three constants. Okay. Okay. And so for three constants, you can see that we have, we need three nodes, right? Because we need three equations in order to solve for, for this. Okay. And so actually, if you look at a quadratic 1D finite element, okay, what you'll see is that it, it actually looks like this, right? And so we have our two n nodes, just like we did for the for the one d case, but we also have a third node here in the middle, where this node right here is is called a mid node. Okay. Okay. And so this is and so this is characteristic for all quadratic elements, right? And so you know whether you're doing a two d finite element simulation with triangles and quadrilaterals. Or a 3D one with um, tetrahedron and hexahedrons. What you'll see is that you know when you make the when you make the transition from linear to quadratic, you know in order to actually make that um, jump, um, the finite element simulation needs to add additional nodes in the middles of your in the middle of your element. Okay. Right. And so if you compare, and so um, you know I think I think some some of you all have tried this already, but you know if you if you run if you create a mesh and you specify all of your elements to be linear. You know you're going to get a certain amount of nodes, okay? Uh, but if you if you try to generate that same mesh where you use quadratic elements, right? And you keep you keep the sizing everything else the same. So the number of elements 
between the two cases are the same, right? What you'll see is that the quadratic, um, the quadratic elements will have many more nodes compared to the linear one, because you know, in order to actually solve for this equation, we need to pre actually create those extra nodes. Okay? And so that's something to consider. And so, you know, I, I think when we went over meshing basics, we talked about how, um, you know, for quadratic finite elements, you're going to incur a higher cost. Right? And so, where that higher cost comes from is the fact that, you know, quadratic elements require more nodes compared to their linear counterparts. Okay. And that's going to increase your computation time. It's going to increase your memory. Okay. Um, you know, even for the exact same amount of elements. Uh, any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay, all right. And so let's see how much time we have. Five more minutes. Okay. And so you know where we're going to go from here, and uh, you know what we're going to do Thursday is we're going to do kind of a rapid fire round of all the different um, finite elements um, or element shapes and settings that are possible. Okay. So we will take a look. And for each and, and for each you know element shape and order configurations, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about a few things, right? And so first of all, we're going to draw it, okay? Just so you know what it looks like, um, you know, um, not only the shape of the element, but how many nodes there are, okay? Uh, we're also going to talk about what the general form for the um, for the approximating polynomial is. Okay. Okay. And for some of them, I say some of them because for for others it gets kind of ridiculous. Uh, we're also going to show uh, what some of the shape functions look like. This is going to be mostly for the 2D stuff because once we once we get to 3D, you know things start to get really ridiculous because if you if you look at a quadratic um, hexahedron element, those have 20 nodes associated with them. And so um, you know I, I don't think that you uh, um, you want to go through you know um, you, I don't think you want to see me write down stuff for you know 15 minutes, and so you know we're not going to list out the shape functions for, for ridiculous ones like that. But, but for some of the ones that have you know maybe three nodes, four nodes, you know six nodes, then you know we'll we'll look at those uh, we'll look at those shape functions and, and what they look like. Okay. All right. Um, and then you know at the end, you know after we take a look at everything, you know we're going to talk a little bit more again about you know what are some of the com comparisons of you know when you would use one type versus the other. One, okay. And so our, thir our Thursday is going to be pretty busy because there's there's quite a lot to there's quite a lot of different element configurations to go through. And so let's just go ahead and, and dive into it then. Okay. And so we're going to start with the two D elements. Just because they're a little bit simpler. Okay. And we're going to start with the linear um, quadrilateral. And so the linear quadrilateral looks like this. Okay. And so this is node I, J, M, and N, okay? All right. <clears throat> and so the, uh, the approximating polynomial for this case, okay? Remember, it's a linear function, and so we're going to have a linear function of x and y, okay? 
And the fact that we have four nodes here, just because you know we need four nodes to define a quadrilateral, tells us that we're gonna have four terms to this approximating polynomial. All right, and so our four terms are gonna be A0, okay? And so we always have to have our constant term, okay? Plus A1x, right? And so we can see we have our linear term in x, Um, since we're in two dimensions, we also have to have our linear term in y, and so we have a2y. Okay. And we need one more term, right? Um, but you know, we've it kind of looks like we've exhausted all of our options because we have a linear term in x, we have our linear term in y, we have our constant term, but we need one more term in order to specify this uh, this quadrilateral. Okay. And the way that we're going to get that is through the cross term. Okay. And so our last term is going to be a three x y, okay? and so I, I know you know I know that x y is technically not a uh, a linear function just because we have two independent variables multiplied by each other, uh, but we call this um, we call this pseudo linear. Because individual, even even though together it's not a linear, it's not a linear term, but individually it's linear in x and linear in, in y. Okay, and so just by that, just by that token, then it counts as a as a linear term. All right, um, and so you know on Thursday we'll we'll pick us up kind of right from from here, and then we'll go through you know quadratic quadrilateral linear triangle quadratic triangle linear tet quadratic tet linear hex quadratic hex, and so it's quite a lot to go through, and so you know. Um, come, come prepared on Thursday. Okay. All right. Any final questions before we wrap up for today? Okay. All right. And so that's, uh, that's all, um, I have for today. So thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in as usual. Um, definitely take a look at the final project and, you know, get started on it early. Um, and as soon as questions come up, then, you know, don't be afraid to, uh, to let me know. Okay. All right. So thank you everybody, you know, enjoy the rest of your evening and I'll see you all on Thursday. Uh, excuse me, professor. Um, can you hear me? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah I was wondering about the the, the midterm project. Yeah. Um, about like uh, the first one, the okay. housing. Um, can we just uh, assume that there are bolts there, and then there's like a like kind of a, I don't know if like there would be like any erosion. I don't know where to put like the rest of the forces. I mean, the only force that came to my mind was the one that. That's I was uh, let, let's talk about this in office hours. I, I think okay. this might take a bit longer to. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. I'll do okay. it later. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good, good question. So, um, yeah, I know at this point we've been using U, but, uh, but this T represents temperature. And so, when I when I wrote these notes, I would also be making transfer at the same time. And so, that T is that. But it could be. Uh, it could be uh, it could be any base, anything. Uh, yes. Yep. More so Thanks, guys. See you later. Professor. What's up? Um, this is uh, not relevant to this class, but to uh, 401 for Thursday's okay. exam. Yep. Um, I was just I was just wondering how many questions are on the exam? There's going to be six. And so there's going to be three short answer questions and then three um, computation questions. OK, sounds good. Thank yep. you so much. Yep. Hey, how's it going? Pretty good, pretty good. I wasn't here. Yep. Yeah.
Yeah. Um, I have yet to watch the lecture. Yeah. But, um, you basically saw it. So okay, it's kind of why I sat back yeah. here as well. So <laughs> I'm just went over the projects and talked about elements. Yeah, yeah. Really. So for so the 540 project, your your geometries are different. And right. so make sure, make sure you look at that. And so for 540, because it's a grad class, I gave you a little bit more challenging. Right. So, I mean, it seems similar, but I figured obviously it's yeah. slightly different. I haven't yeah. gone fully through it, but mm -hmm. I'm sure I'll have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Um okay, so just if I just watched the lecture, I should be fine. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I mean, we we basically covered I was kind of like not paying attention. Oh, okay, okay. I'm studying for quiz from other ah, class right now. I, gotcha, I, gotcha. I was trying to like pay attention because I, the um, other guy in our class, Jake, told me that you guys just did review the project and the yeah. Okay, that's okay. cool. I appreciate it. I'll see you tomorrow. Yep, see you tomorrow. All right, Nick, did you uh, have any more questions? Oh, oh. oh, you're still on the Zoom call. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Okay, I messed up.